to introduce our speaker for today's lecture, Updating Arthritis, Good Drugs for Bad Joints, Dr. Birnbaum. Um, Dr. Neil Birnbaum is one of the founders of Pacific Rheumatology Associates Medical Group. He is committed to teaching the next generation of physicians serving as director of the Division of Rheumatology at California Pacific Medical Center. Um, and as clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He lectures frequently to residents and practicing physicians on various topics in the exciting field of rheumatology. And while maintaining a busy practice, Dr. Birnbaum has found time to serve in various vol voluntary leadership roles. He was twice chief staff at CPMC and was president of the California Society of Medicine. He was also chairman of the Medical and Scientific Committee of the Arthritis Foundation in Northern California. I will stop my share screen now, Dr. Birnbaum. Please take it away. Okay. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for signing into this program. It's always a little odd to do these virtual programs where we can't see the audience and uh, even know whether you're awake or whether you stayed with us, but please uh, try to stick with it. This is not a terribly long uh, talk. I want to leave lots of time for uh, Q&A, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have as best that I possibly can. I wanted to do today was give you just a run through through some of the most common things that a rheumatologist sees. We're, one of the things I've always liked about rheumatology, which I've been practicing for many years, was the spectrum of illness that we see. And there, there are probably a hundred different diseases that fall within the realm of a rheumatologist. But today we're going to talk about uh, maybe a half dozen or so of the most common ones. I'm going to use, uh, particularly focus today about some of the newer therapies and try to tell you some of the exciting things that have happened in rheumatology and um, particularly over the last 25 years or so where we've had the advent of these very exciting uh, newer therapies, the so-called biologic therapies. So if you will um, bear with me, we'll try to lead you through that. Get something out of the way here. There we go. All right. We go back. There we go. All right. So this is a picture of, of what I like to call knobby fingers. And if you look at this, uh, you will see uh, that you have uh, these knobs out here and these little joints at the end. And you've got some changes in this row of knuckles, and, but you don't see much in the big knuckles. With, so these are called the MCP joints and uh, metacarpal phalangeal joints. And then we've got, um, Somehow this is advancing on its own, and I don't know why. Um, and then you've got these uh, other, uh, so these are called the distal interphalangeal joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints, and then the metacarpal phalangeal. So this is a problem that involves the uh, DIP and, and PIP joints, distal and proximal interphalangeal joints. And those are uh, typical of what we call osteoarthritis or degenerative or old age or wear and tear, other words that you can use to describe uh, uh, something that's really a degenerative aging process. Uh, this particular uh, area of osteoarthritis is quite genetic or, uh, or hereditary in nature, it tends to run somewhat more in the female side of families. Uh, and well, so if someone walks in with fingers that look like this, I can very quickly say, well, this is osteoarthritis. Uh, did your mom have it? Did your grandmother have it? Now it could be in, in men, but more common in women. This kind of problem usually comes up over many years. Um, oftentimes the deformity is more troubling than any discomfort that people have. It's not uncommon when one of these pops up that it's quite tender and sore initially for the first so 12 to 18 months, eventually the soreness tends to go away or maybe jumps to another finger, but the lump is there. And if you feel these and squeeze these, uh, these have a bony, hard feeling. These are not squishy, uh, they're, they're bony. And that's because these are bone spurs. So if you look then, this is an X-ray of 
the distal interphalangeal joints. And we can see here that you have these bone spurs, and then we have areas in, normally in a joint, there should be a dark line across the joint where the cartilage is. On an X-ray, you cannot see cartilage. You see the cartilage as a space between the joints. And here you can see that now these bones look right up against each other, so-called bone-on-bone, a term that you've probably heard along the way, meaning that you don't longer see the X-ray. And then you see these bone spurs. Um, I'm having trouble with this, not a great, uh, the pointer is not working very well. And you see these bone spurs here with new bones. So what you're feeling when you squeeze that uh, joint, that Heberden's node, is really the new bone, the bone spur or osteophyte. And that's the hallmark of osteoarthritis, as opposed to rheumatoid arthritis, which I'll show you in a few minutes, is um, more of a squishy feeling because the problem lies within the joint lining, the synovium, uh, which is a soft tissue. So this is a typical appearance of osteoarthritis. If we live long enough, all of us get osteoarthritis someplace. It may be a knobby finger. It may be a creaky knee. It may be a pain in the neck or a pain in the back, uh, or it can be a large joint like a hip or a knee. But everybody past age 40 or 50, if they were to have x-rays done would show some degenerative arthritis someplace in their body. It's simply, again, part of the aging uh, process. And it may range from utterly asymptomatic, just an x-ray finding, to people who real have real problems uh, that require uh, some type of an aggressive uh, treatment. So here you see someone who's got very far advanced osteoarthritis of the knee. If you look at the knee that's on the left in this picture, but it's really a right, it's somebody's right knee, you can see that on the outside part of the knee, there you still see this space. So that's the cartilage. On an x-ray, the cartilage is a dark line. Over here, now you see that that space is gone. And the um, now that the cartilage has been worn away, so this is a so-called bone-on-bone finding. Now, on a plain X-ray, you don't see cartilage. You need an MRI to do to look at cartilage. You don't need an MRI in this patient to tell you that this patient has far advanced cartilage loss, and really nothing is going to fix this patient other than a knee replacement. This patient happens to have be a little bit unusual uh, because they've got the uh, medial uh, side on this knee, and they've got the lateral side on the other knee. Uh, the most common finding in osteoarthritis is to have bilateral medial compartment disease. Uh, so that would be to have this look like that as well. And that's going to lead the patient to be bow-legged uh, because as you wear out the inside part of the knee before the outside part, that is going to cause a bow leg deformity. A very typical characteristic. If you watch people walking down the street with they're wearing shorts, you can tell pretty quickly who's got the far advanced osteoarthritis of their knees. So that's this uh, gives you one of the large joint areas where uh, osteoarthritis can be uh, present. Now, what about osteoarthritis? I've already told you it's part of the aging process. Uh, everybody's going to have at least a little bit of it. Uh, but the, there's kind of a good news, bad news with osteoarthritis. Uh, the good news is most people don't have it bad. The bad news is I can't do a whole lot about osteoarthritis. For all the, the remarkable advances that have been developed in the last 25 years for inflammatory arthritis, for rheumatoid and other forms of inflammatory arthritis, we don't have that in osteoarthritis. We don't have a medicine which slows down the rate of wearing out of cartilage or that regenerates new cartilage. The management of osteoarthritis is the management of pain. 
whether that's pain by changing your activity. Um, we often will tell people who are runners to become walkers or walkers to become bikers or swimmers. Uh, that plays a role in management of osteoarthritis. Uh, some people will start thinking about how many times a day they run up and down the steps and plan their trips out so that they don't have to make that uh, excursion quite as often. Uh, and particularly going downstairs is difficult for people with osteoarthritis of the knees. If people are significantly overweight, knees and hips don't like to carry that extra weight around. So weight reduction is important, not easy to obtain. Uh, bracing for uh, osteoarthritis of the knee, uh, there are some, some braces which tend to shift weight from the, let's say the medial compartment of the knee to the lateral compartment, but they're very bulky and very few people will wear those uh, braces. They're called unloader braces. And then we have uh, canes and walkers and other things that take weight off affected knee. Uh, so those are kind of the non-medicine things that are out there. And let's talk about medicines. We have pain relievers. So Tylenol uh, is acetaminophen. That's a pure pain reliever. It has no uh, anti-inflammatory uh, characteristics. And then we have over-the-counter Advil, that's ibuprofen, and Aleve, which is naproxen. Uh, those are uh, pain reliever and anti-inflammatory. And there's some degree of inflammation in osteoarthritis. It's predominantly degenerative. Uh, but there may be some low-level inflammation. Tylenol makes a very reasonable first choice for pain relief because of its safety. So if we talk about Tylenol, acetaminophen, uh, it's quite safe to take up to 3,000 milligrams per day. Doesn't mean you have to take that much. I'm saying that it's safe to take that much. Uh, and if you talk about extra strength Tylenol, that would be six a day, because they're 500 milligram each, so two, three times a day. Uh, if, it, if you use arthritis strength tunnel, the only difference between that and extra strength tunnel is the number of milligrams in the tablet. So regular tunnel is 325, extra strength is 500, and arthritis strength is 650. So if you take arthritis strength, the maximum is four tablets a day. If we're talking about uh, Advil, ibuprofen, and to leave uh, a, perhaps a little more effective, but also some greater risk of side effects, things particularly involving the stomach. So we talk about NSAID gastropathy. Uh, it can be anything from just stomach irritation, heartburn, up to out and out um, ulcers and, and, and bleeding. So we wanna be sure that people take those uh, with food and that um, we're, uh, being careful about total amounts. Uh, if you're going to take these without a doctor uh, supervision, uh, you want to maybe limit the Advil to six or eight per day and they leave maybe two to four. In general, it takes about two Advil to equal one a leave. And then we have the prescription non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We've got uh, most, almost all these today are generic uh, drugs that used to uh, be prescription. Uh, and, uh, or excuse me, branded products. So we've got Celebrex or Celecoxib, uh, which is the only what's called COX-2 non -steroidal. It's still on the market. It's uh, perhaps a little easier on stomachs, but still has stomachs as its most common side effect. And then we have uh, diclofenac, ibuprofen, naproxen. And one that's uh, become quite popular in the last few years is a topical anti-inflammatory uh, that's diclofenac or Voltaren gel, and uh, that's now available over the counter. So the things that you can buy over the counter for osteoarthritis include uh, Tonal, Advil, Leave, and uh, Voltaren gel. Uh, another interesting medicine that's FDA approved for osteoarthritis is Cymbalta, otherwise known as duloxetine. Uh, Cymbalta is in the same family as uh, antidepressants. Uh, it's an SSRI. It's been shown that uh, people who have chronic pain have low levels of serotonin uh, circulating around their, their brain. And that's similar to what's 
seen also in patients who have um, mood disorder, uh, chronic depression, sleep disorder, fatigue, all share a common characteristic of a low serotonin level and medications can raise serotonin levels. And in particular, uh, you have some Balta marketed for chronic pain, including osteoarthritis uh, pain. Then we've got uh, various things you can put into joints. And uh, the ones that are FDA approved currently is uh, uh, cortisone, uh, particularly trimcinolone and, and other uh, steroids can be used uh, usually in a large joint like a, a knee. These can be very helpful. They can't be done too often. I try not to inject the same joint more than twice a year. If it's done judiciously twice a year, then it's actually quite protective of cartilage. If you were to do joint injections every month, then instead of protecting cartilage, they can actually break down cartilage. Uh, there are a number of other agents that are called visco supplementation uh, drugs like Synvisc and Orthovisc and Halgen and Supars. There's four or five or six of them that I like to call WD-40 for joints. Um, they're made up of the building blocks of, of collagen. Uh, I have not had great success with these drugs. In fact, I no longer use visco supplementation agents. There are rheumatologists and orthopedists who are true believers. Uh, I would think they're at this point the minority of people in those specialties, but there are some patients who seem to get some benefit from visco supplementation. The shots are, can be done up to uh, a couple times a year. Things that are out there that are quite controversial at the moment, we've got PRP or platelet-rich plasma. It involves taking the patient's blood, spinning it uh, to separate the cells from the plasma and giving the plasma back. Uh, it is currently not uh, Medicare approved, which is why insurance doesn't pay for it. It's fairly expensive for people to pay cash. And the same thing is true today for the currently available stem cell therapies. Uh, over time, stem cells may have a role in the regeneration of cartilage, but the substances that are currently available, I don't think are ready for prime time. Um, if you look at the few studies that have been done that are truly well done, scientific double-blind placebo-controlled trials for PRP and stem cells, they're not terribly effective. And even visco supplementation, although it is FDA approved, has pretty limited data. Uh, there are true believers and they're among doctors and patients. So for some individuals, uh, these may be of, of benefit, um, but I am not on that bandwagon at, at the moment. So the only thing that I personally put into joints is small amounts of cortisone. Uh, let's talk about also um, the various supplements that are out there and diets that are out there. Uh, we already talked about a weight reduction diet can be helpful. But as far as all of the other diets that are promoted, the um, Mediterranean diets or uh, other anti-inflammatory diets or the no nightshade diets, at this point, there's anecdotal reports of response, uh, meaning the patient says, well, I went on X diet and it helped me. I cut out nightshades or I cut out gluten and it helped me. And that's fine. But when put to a scientific trial, none of these have been shown to work particularly better than placebo. And the issue in any arthritis trial that's done is the placebo response rate. And about 25 to 30 percent of people given a placebo for arthritis will feel better. Uh, if you think about some of these diets, they're not really too easy to do. It's hard to be gluten free and uh, See, people kind of want it to work. So whether or not that's a real effect or a placebo effect remains to be seen. But any trial that's done should have a placebo arm so that you know that the beneficial effect of the active arm is really significantly better than the placebo arm. So that's a little bit about the management of osteoarthritis, again, the management of pain. And then when all else fails, there's surgery. 
And this is particularly done for large joints, uh, hips, knees, fair number of shoulders uh, are now being replaced uh, because of osteoarthritis. Uh, these have revolutionized the management of osteoarthritis, um, kept people out of wheelchairs. Uh, they really can be very effective. There's hundreds of thousands of them done every year in the United States with uh, great success. About 95% of people that have their hip or knee done will tell you they were very happy that they had the surgery. So that's, uh, I told you a little bit about osteoarthritis. If you have some questions about that, uh, please jot them down and we'll come back to them at the end. I wanna be sure we have a chance to uh, cover all the topics and I think we will and then we'll come back for the questions. Now, osteoporosis. So let's contrast osteoarthritis, which is a disease of joints, of cartilage, and osteoporosis, which is a disease of bone. And it's uh, characterized by low bone mass and a decline in the what they call the microarchitectural uh, structure of bone with a consequential uh, increase in bone fragility and susceptibility to fracture. That's an old definition. So here you see on the left side, this is from the very college rheumatology slide collection, um, normal bone. And on the right side, you see a lot of air and uh, much less bone. So the way I like to think about this is if you took two sponges and the one sponge, the one on the left is dense and it's, a, and it's got mainly sponge and little tiny air pockets. That sponge is harder to squeeze than if you took a sponge like the one on the right, which that's a, a lot of air and, and not too much sponge. So the same thing happens in, in bone. And if you have decreased bone density, it's pretty obvious that you're more likely to fracture bone. Uh, fractures tend to occur um, in several areas, but particularly in, uh, in the spine as we get older, uh, that you develop anterior wedging of the vertebrae so that there's a development of the so-called dowager's hump or kyphoscoliosis uh, and becomes quite common as, as we age. It's particularly common in women uh, who start to have problems uh, after menopause. Men can develop osteoporosis, but it's usually uh, much less common, uh, more likely to have some other predisposing factors such as people who are significantly underweight or heavy smokers or heavy drinkers. In, in women, the most common factors are postmenopausal status in uh, someone who has a family history of osteoporosis, uh, Caucasians are more likely to have this than, than uh, people of, of color, uh, people who were smokers, who, who were um, heavy, heavy drinkers, people had uh, early uh, premature menopause, all are, are at increased risk of osteoporosis. So the way that we look at osteoporosis is to do a test called a DEXA. Uh, just lie there on the table. I'm sure some of you have had this done. The machine passes over you. We usually do measurements uh, over the spine, the lumbar spine, and over the hip. If you've had a hip replacement or two hip replacements, they may do the forearm instead. So what is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is a definition. It's taken from a number on a bone density machine, on a DEXA machine. And you get two scores when you have a DEXA done. One is called a T-score and one is called a Z-score. The Z-score uh, compares you to, if this is a woman having this done, uh, women of, of your age. Uh, but the definition of osteoporosis is the T-score, which is comparing you to women of maximal bone density, which is around age 30. If you have a DEXA done, uh, and your T-score is within one standard deviation of that group of healthy 30-year-olds, that's considered normal. If you're between minus one and minus 2.5, that's osteopenia. And if you're more than minus 2.5, that's considered osteoporosis. Now, this particular slide said 
severe osteoporosis was a definite, uh, uh, excuse me, a T-score of minus 2.5 with fragility fractures, meaning fractures with minimal trauma. You coughed or sneezed or just stepped off the curb and something breaks. Um, I would use the term symptomatic osteoporosis rather than severe because osteoporosis really doesn't cause symptoms until you break something. And the uh, goal here is to prevent that from occurring. Uh, if you have a T-score that's even in the osteopenic range, but you uh, have had a fragility fracture, because that can you, you don't have to have osteoporosis to have a fragility fracture, uh, that would be called, that's consistent with a diagnosis of osteoporosis, even if the number is not that bad. So the presence of a fragility fracture trumps the actual number on the bone density machine. But in general, these are the numbers that go along with osteoporosis. And the goal is to prevent progression from asymptomatic osteoporosis, a number on a DEXA machine, to symptomatic osteoporosis, the development of fractures or significant height loss and uh, a dorsal kyphosis. So this just shows you that as the T-score declines, that the risk of uh, fracture of the femoral neck, the femoral neck is, is what where the ball attaches to the uh, neck of the uh, femur, that's the typical place where you break your femur. And as the T-score gets worse, the fracture rate goes up rather dramatically. So what's out there for osteoporosis? I think the first thing is prevention. Uh, what can be done? Uh, you certainly want people, since you can't pick your family, uh, to stay active, to do uh, weight-bearing exercise. Uh, there are a very few medical conditions where being too thin is a problem, but the osteoporosis is one. So people who are underweight uh, are at increased risk. Uh, people who smoke, people who drink, uh, are all at increased risk. People should do regular weight bearing exercise. Uh, if, they're, if they don't have a diet that uh, has significant uh, calcium and vitamin D, they certainly should supplement uh, with that. I think of calcium and vitamin D as the bricks and, and mortar of building bone and some of the uh, medications are, are, the, are the brick mason. So looking for routine testing is some Disabil uh, disagreement about when to do the testing. Uh, some people do it at menopause. Some people recommend for women at about age 60. Uh, there's other controversy about testing in men. I don't routinely test all men, but I certainly would test somebody who was a, a heavy smoker. Uh, fortunately, we don't have a whole lot of people like that in San Francisco, um, or if they had a strong family history. Uh, estrogen therapy has kind of fallen from disfavor. Um, and uh, it used to be women would go through menopause and would be put on estrogen because of their hot flashes and other uh, menopausal symptoms. And then they would be kept on estrogens for forever uh, for their potential to uh, improve bone density. But we know that over time, there are some risks, particularly for breast and uterine cancer from prolonged estrogen therapy. So we would not use estrogens today uh, to uh, treat osteoporosis long-term, long-term meaning beyond the time when they're needed for hot flashes. Uh, and then we have uh, a number of other agents that are out there. Uh, the way to think about uh, these drugs, and the way I try to explain to patients, what happens, how do you get osteoporosis? You get osteoporosis because uh, there's a disconnect between cells that are breaking down old bone that are called osteoclasts and cells that are making new bone, they're called osteoblasts. And bone is constantly remodeling and turning over. And the reason you get osteoporosis is because those cells that are um, building new bone can't keep up with the cells that are tearing down old bone. Think about the machinery you see out on the highway uh, that's tearing out up old asphalt and the second machine comes along and it's laying down new asphalt. Well, that's the way things happen in bone. 
yet the cells that are making the new bone slow down over time. So how do most of the medicines work? They're called anti-resorptive. Anti-resorptive means that they um, slow down the cells that are tearing down old bone. They slow down the osteoclast, so the osteoblast can catch up. Uh, many of these drugs are called bisphosphonates, and uh, the most common one being Fosamax or Alendronate. Another common one is uh, Actinel, uh, which is oral Beneva, which is oral or IV, but if it do it IV, you have to do it more than once a year. And there's Reclast or Zoledronic Acid, uh, which is a once a year IV drug. Uh, many times people will be given an oral bisphosphonate like Fosamax first, uh, but there's a fair number of people who don't tolerate it. it uh, most common side effect is uh, heartburn due to regurgitation of stomach contents up into the esophagus. The drug has to be taken first thing in the morning on a, an empty stomach with a full glass of water, and you can't lie down for 30 minutes after you take it, uh, and you can't eat for 30 minutes after you take it. The reason why you have to take it that way is because it's not well absorbed into the body from the stomach. If it has to compete with food, it doesn't get absorbed. So it needs an empty stomach and a full glass of water to get dissolved and absorbed. And you don't want to lie down because that allows the stomach contents to slosh back up into the esophagus and increase the risk of heartburn. Uh, so for those patients, one of the IV drugs uh, is helpful. And the most common one is uh, Reclass or Zoledronic Acid, which is a, a once yearly IV. Uh, there's another drug called Evista, which is called a CIRM, uh, selective estrogen receptor modifier. I, I don't use a whole lot of that. Uh, and I think now what's become quite popular uh, is another uh, powerful anti-resorptive drug called Prolia. Uh, it's a, a twice a year uh, injection, not an IV, but a, a subcutaneous injection uh, that's usually given in the, in the doctor's office. Uh, these drugs are very effective at decreasing the uh, fracture rate in people who have uh, osteoporosis. And uh, the people you really want to be aggressive in treating are people who have already had one or more uh, fragility fractures because they're at the greatest risk of having yet more fractures. And then we have a drug, uh, uh, I said, I, I, I already mentioned Prolia, denosumab. Uh, it's also an anti-resorptive, a little different mechanism of, uh, of action, uh, not a bisphosphonate. And then we have a couple of drugs that are uh, anab uh, anabolic. They actually stimulate the osteoblasts, um, the drugs that are making new uh, bone cells. Uh, these are Forteo and Timlos. Uh, they're, they're not terribly popular because they require people to give themselves a daily shot at the home. And usually these are reserved for patients who have already fractured while on a uh, anti-resorptive drug. So the patient's been on Fosamax, but yet they're continuing to have these fragility fractures. Then uh, patients are often given 18 to 24 months of Forteo or Timlos. Uh, once they've completed that 18 to 24 months, which results in a rather rapid increase in bone density, they then have to be switched back to an anti-resorptive drug to maintain the benefits uh, that they got from, from the original drug. Now, one of the things that's come up with anti-resorptive agents uh, is the idea that there are some long-term potential side effects. And I wanna stress that these side effects are very uncommon and that it, the risk of having a fragility fracture far outweighs the chance of these rare side effects. So two that are talked about, one is called ONJ, or osteonecrosis of the jaw, uh, where there can be the uh, death of bone in the, in the jaw. And the other are odd fractures uh, across the shaft of the femur, not the neck of the femur where you normally have a fragility fracture, but across the, the shaft of the femur, the mid thigh. And it's been shown with um, bisphosphonates that they're very tightly bound to the bone. 
uh, and that it, you can stop the medication after a few years. And a lot of that medicine sticks around for a long time and continues to be of, of benefit. Uh, and by giving a drug a holiday, uh, after maybe five years of therapy, uh, there's maintenance of the benefit and a, a significant reduction in these uh, unusual uh, side effects. One thing I should note in that with uh, reclass, where most of these things have been seen, uh, was usually reported not people receiving uh, zoledronic acid for osteoporosis, but patients receiving it for metastatic disease to bone, so cancers that have spread to the bone. And in that situation, uh, the zoledronic acid is given as four milligrams once a month, whereas if you're taking it for osteoporosis, it's five milligrams once a year. So the risk is much, much less. And a lot of people have stopped taking their uh, bisphosphonate, whether it's Fosamax or Reclass, because they're so concerned about these very rare side effects. Again, the chance of the rare side effect is much, much, much less than the chance of a fragility fracture. But there is the concept now of drug holiday. One of the differences between the bisphosphonates like Fosamax uh, and Reclass and Prolia is that the Prolia is not as tightly bound to the bone and currently is not eligible for a drug holiday. So that drug is continued um, as long as the patient uh, has uh, a bone density in the osteoporotic range. With uh, Fosamax or Reclass, Again, if you've gone several years, bone density is stable, you haven't had a fracture, then stopping and repeating the bone density two or three years later uh, is, is okay and recommended. So that's a little bit about osteoporosis. Now, this is going to switch from degenerative problems to inflammatory autoimmune problems. This is rheumatoid arthritis. And here you can see that we have these uh, swellings in the soft tissues. Uh, again, I have that right there. The PIP joint is swollen right where my pointer is. And that's uh, a typical appearance of rheumatoid arthritis. And again, looks different from osteoarthritis. There's probably 100 osteoarthritis patients for every rheumatoid. So rheumatoid arthritis is a much less common problem. It uh, traditionally was quoted as being maybe 1% of adult patients. I think that number is a little high. Uh, if that were the case in San Francisco, we ought to have uh, eight or 9,000 cases of rheumatoid arthritis. And I really don't think that we have that, that many. Uh, but it's still a reasonably common inflammatory arthritis. It's a disease of uh, what we used to call women of childbearing years. Uh, it's women maybe five times as often as men. Uh, oftentimes there's a family history of someone in the family, uh, mom or sibling or aunt, uncle having had RA. Um, it traditionally starts as a symmetrical uh, small joint uh, involvement of the hands uh, and or feet uh, with prominent nighttime pain and morning stiffness. So the hallmark of Inflammatory arthritis is nighttime pain, morning stiffness, better with activity, which is the opposite of what we see in osteoarthritis, where the patient tends to be not too bad when they first wake up, but worse as they try to do weight-bearing activity during the day. So this is a typical appearance of rheumatoid arthritis. Here you see a, this bump on the edge of his elbow. Really having there is my pointer. Uh, you see there. Let me go back. Uh, that's a rheumatoid nodule. So rheumatoid arthritis is really rheumatoid disease. That there are various extra articular manifestations meaning beyond the joints that you can see in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, these have actually become much less common in the era of modern therapies, which I'll discuss with you in just a just a moment. Um, 
So what are the classification criteria? These, these are the old classification criteria, but I think in some ways with, for a talk like this, they're, they're a little easier to understand. Uh, prominent morning stiffness, not just two minutes till you walk to the bathroom, but a patient with rheumatoid arthritis often says, uh, I got to get up at least an hour early if I'm going to get to be someplace because it takes me that long to get loosened up. I've got to move around. I got to have my coffee. Got to take a hot shower. I got to do my stretching exercises and then I can get dressed and go about my day. And this is not just achy joints. This is swollen joints. If people have achy joints, that's called arthralgias or achy. And that may be the start of rheumatoid arthritis, but to make the diagnosis, you really need some swollen joints and particularly the small joints of the hands and feet and often in a fairly symmetric pattern. Now, eventually you see erosions on x-ray. Uh, we'd like to be able to make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis before there are erosions, before there's evidence of permanent damage, when there's just pain and soft tissue swelling. We call that the, the window of opportunity when patients, if they're aggressively treated, you can turn this process off and prevent permanent damage. Talked about the presence of rheumatoid nodules as being less common today. And then we do have some uh, laboratory studies, uh, rheumatoid factor. Uh, there's a, a somewhat more modern test called CCP antibody, which sometimes turns positive before the rheumatoid factor. And oftentimes we see elevation in measures of inflammation, such as the SED rate or ESR, and the CRP, C-reactive protein. They're non-specific measures of inflammation, but they are often present in patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. So I told you earlier that the treatment of osteoarthritis has changed very little over the years. The treatment of rheumatoid arthritis has changed dramatically. And particularly in the last now almost 25 years, since the beginning of uh, biologic therapies. So if we talk about rheumatoid and other forms of inflammatory arthritis, we've got certain medications that are used to treat the acute symptoms, the pain and, and the inflammation that's present. And those are anti-inflammatories. We have non steroidal anti-inflammatories, like we talked about before for osteoarthritis, and we have prednisone or cortisone as a steroidal anti-inflammatory. These control symptoms, but they don't really alter the course of the disease. So if we have a patient where the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis has been established, we always want to put those patients on um, what, are, what we call DMARDs, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Some of those drugs are quite old. They're called conventional DMARDs or traditional DMARDs. They include uh, Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, that's the drug that our former president thought worked so well for uh, COVID. It doesn't really work for COVID, but it has been used in rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory uh, diseases for many years. Uh, there's another one called sulfasalazine. And then a mainstay of treatment dating back now to about 1980 is methotrexate, a drug that was originally used to treat uh, certain malignancies has been used in uh, rheumatoid arthritis in lower doses than when we use for a, a malignancy, but uh, with a great deal of success. And until um, 1998 or nine was really the only uh, new drug we had had uh, the previous 20 years. Uh, there's another drug called Arav or Leflunamide, which is another conventional DMR that's not used as much today. And then there are advocates of what's called triple therapy, which is the use of three conventional DMARs, plaquenil, sulfasalazine, and methotrexate together. And th there's some pretty good data for triple therapy, but it doesn't have the, what I like to call the wow factor of a uh, biologic drug. And it's um, will be used sometimes when there's a concern about cost because um, you have three. Uh, old line conventional drugs are all available as a generic and uh, maybe much less expensive than any of the biologics. And then we have the biologic revolution. What's a biologic therapy? A biologic therapy means a uh, drug produced within a living cell. 
We have in our body certain uh, mediators of inflammation called cytokines. There are pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And the pro-inflammatory cytokines are there in excess in patients who have um, rheumatoid arthritis and similar problems. So we can block these. So this is like a, a laser-guided cruise missile therapy, what's called a targeted therapy that blocks a very specific part of the immune system. So you have drugs like Enbrel, Remicade, Umera, Simsia, Symphony, Symphony Aria that block uh, TNF. And then we have others that block um, other parts of the immune system called interleukins. So the most commonly used ones are the TNFs. They started with Enbrel and Remicade in the late 90s. And then we've had others come along, uh, Symphony Aria, most recently, probably eight or 10 years ago. And then we've had a number of other biologic therapies that target other very specific parts of the immune system, uh, whether it's T lymphocytes or B lymphocytes or uh, interleukins uh, that you see there. And these uh, have, again, been very helpful for a lot of patients. One of the things we don't have right now is a test that tells me oh, in this patient, I should be using an anti-TNF. In this patient, I should be using an anti-B cell therapy or T-cell therapy or an anti il 6 therapy. That simply does not exist currently. So we go through a trial and error process. Now, in the last 10 years, I'm going to drink here. We've had some newer, uh, what are called synthetic, small molecules, these are pills. The biologic therapies all have to be by injection or by infusion. And the reason for that is that they're large molecules with proteins. And if they were given orally, they wouldn't get absorbed into the stomach. So we now have some new oral agents that work against another uh, part of the immune system called uh, Janus kinases. And these are Janus kinase inhibitors. And there are currently three on the market, uh, Zelljans, Illumin, and, and Renvolk. And these can be quite helpful to uh, um, give uh, to patients who cannot, uh, have not responded to one of the other agents. There's been a warning with these drugs in the last year uh, with some increased risk of uh, cardiac events reported in one large, uh, what's called sur surveillance uh, study, uh, whether it was heart attacks or um, blood clots, strokes. Uh, and for that reason, there's now a warning on this class of drugs that they sh should be used um, in people who failed a TNF. Uh, before, we were often using these drugs uh, like the other biologics after methotrexate uh, inadequate responders, but now but there's another step in, in there that we have to use a TNF first. Uh, the results of that study were somewhat controversial. Uh, there was not everyone agreed with the fact that the FDA applied the warning to uh, all patients uh, for all indications of the drugs and for all drugs in the class, but that's the way it is. Uh, so until uh, companies come up with another study with um, other data, uh, that's the FDA, I don't think is gonna change their uh, warning. So it dramatically decreases the marketplace for these drugs because the biologics work very, very well. So these become a fallback for that smaller group of patients who uh, do not respond to uh, other biologic therapies. And lastly, in rheumatoid arthritis, there is surgery, but the number of patients requiring surgery for rheumatoid arthritis joint destruction is far, far less than it used to be uh, in the 1990s and earlier. Uh, because these medications work, the number of patients going on to require hand reconstruction or knee replacement or hip replacement due to rheumatoid arthritis is much less. And very commonly what I see today are patients who have lived with their rheumatoid arthritis for 20 or 30 years, and they're now coming in and complaining of advanced hip or knee disease, not because they have 
rheumatoid arthritis in their joints, but because they're old enough to have developed osteoarthritis. So really a dramatic changes in the management of rheumatoid disease in the second half of my career. So this is another disease. Originally we talked about rheumatoid arthritis as disease of small joints of the hands and feet. This is inflammatory disease of the spine or spondylitis, a, a group of disorders called spondyloarthropathies or spinal arthritis. And here you see this remarkable set of x-rays uh, taken every uh, 10 years. It's a, it's a famous uh, a series, so even though they're very old, people show it of this young man who starts and becomes progressively bent over. And finally, you see in the last film, he's now somewhat erect again, not in the cane. And that's because he had his hips replaced uh, because you can see hip involvement in this disease as well. Another common form, probably the second most common form of inflammatory arthritis is psoriatic arthritis. So you've got psoriasis, a common skin disease occurs in one to two percent of the population, and about twenty percent of people who have uh, psoriasis get an arthritis from it. Uh, it can be in several different uh, places in the body, several different patterns. Here we see. Get back to my, my pointer is advancing the slide. Uh, here we see this uh, swelling here at the distal interphalangeal joint. And oftentimes it's in the arthritis that has the most uh, nail involvement. So psoriasis can affect uh, skin and scalp and uh, different areas and including uh, nails. So you can see a um, involvement of the DIP joint. You can see an asymmetric oligoarticular arthritis, meaning a few joints in a non-symmetric fashion, or you can see a pseudo rheumatoid form of this, where it looks more like rheumatoid arthritis as a symmetrical arthritis, but the patients have um, uh, psoriasis and not RA. And you see in the uh, index, excuse me, in the ring finger of the left hand, where the whole finger is quite swollen, and that's called uh, dactylitis or sausaging, and that's quite characteristic of psoriatic arth arthritis. So what do we have for seronegative arthritis? Seronegative meaning the patient does not have a rheumatoid factor uh, in their blood or a CCP antibody. So seronegative arthritis. Uh, some of these patients will have a genetic marker, uh, particularly if there's spinal involvement called HLA-B27. It's a genetic marker. It, it sits on the sixth chromosome. Uh, it's present in about 6% of everybody, but it's present in 70 to 90% of people who have a spondyloarthropathy. So it's a, a uh, quite good test that was the first time uh, ever when it was shown that there was a specific gene that went with a specific group of diseases. It was back when I was in, in training in the 1970s uh, that the articles came out saying, yeah, there, there's a, this is a genetic marker and it could be quite helpful. So the treatment for uh, seronegative disease, is, some of it is very similar to what uh, is used uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. We've got non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, there's another drug called azulfidine or sulfasalazine that's been used, uh, methotrexate, uh, and then more recently, the anti-TNFs uh, have been very dramatic, and they work for both the the skin and nail findings, as well as the joint findings of psoriatic arthritis. And then we've seen in the last 10 years or so, medications which originally were used in psoriasis, now coming over to being used in um, the treatment of psoriatic arthritis. Again, they work to improve both skin and joints, and they block other specific parts of the immune system, particularly in the interleukin pathway. So there's ones called Cosentix and TALTS that block IL-17. You've got one called Stolar that blocks interleukin-1223. And the latest ones have the great names of Skyrizi and Tremphia, and they block uh, interleukin-23. They're extremely effective at improving skin involvement. And 
you've known anybody with really bad psoriasis, it, it's uh, very unpleasant to live with and people are very embarrassed by it. Uh, um, and these drugs work very, very well for the skin. Uh, they may not work quite as well as anti-TNFs do for, for the joints, but they, they can be quite effective. And then there is one oral agent called Otesla uh, that's approved for psoriatic art arthritis, which has the advantage of being a pill, uh, has the advantage of being extremely safe, doesn't require any regular laboratory monitoring, but isn't quite as effective as some of these biologic therapies. So it's, it's nice to use for people who have milder disease. So an explosion of drugs for uh, spondylitis and for psoriatic art arthritis. Uh, uh, it's almost hard to keep track of them. There have been so many that have come out in the last 10 years, but we really are able to change the course of uh, both skin and joint involvement. Here's one of my favorite diseases to treat. This is gout. Uh, gout, if you have it down there in the big toe, and you see that red, angry bunion joint of the big toe, is called pedagra, an old Greek word. Uh, this patient seems to have a gout attack both in the bunion joint of the big toe as well as some swelling in, in the ankle. Gout traditionally is in the foot and particularly in that first MTP joint, but if you've had gout for a while, it can certainly present in other joints as well. So gout is caused by an overabundance of uh, uric acid, or which crystallizes into monosodium uric crystals. You get gout either by being an overproducer of uh, uric acid or under excretor of uric acid. Think of it as um, uric acid levels like a, a bathtub and a certain amount of water in the tub, and that's determined by how open is the spigot or, or how clogged up is the drain. And that determines the, in this case, the blood level of uric acid. So it's a disease associated with an antiquity um, and usually associated with high, high living and uh, good food and wine. And uh, so that's, uh, it's kind of fun to treat because it's so treatable. This is uh, a crystal exam. The definitive gold standard for diagnosing gout is to take fluid out of a joint and look at it under a polarizing microscope and seeing these needle-shaped crystals under the polarizer. Now, we don't have to do that um, very often because it's not fun to have a needle put into a severely inflamed joint. But if there's a doubt as to the diagnosis, this is the gold standard test. So how about treating gout? One question has been, what about the patient who just has a high uric acid level that was tested for some reason it's above normal. Do you need to treat that? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, patients may have asymptomatic hyperuricemia for years before they ever have a gout attack. So there's no re real reason to treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia. Uh, then you have the acute treatment of the acute gout attack. And here you're looking for something that's a, a potent anti-inflammatory, the ancient drug is colchicine. I think that Hippocrates wrote for, for colchicine. And um, so that's uh, something that uh, it can still be used. We don't use it like we used to use it, which used to be here, take um, two tablets or, or take one tablet per hour uh, until you either feel better or can't get out of the bathroom because it can cause very bad diarrhea. The current way to give colchicine is uh, two immediately at one an hour or two later, and then one twice a day for a few days until the attack recedes. The other acute treatment are non steroidal anti-inflammatories, and any of them can work. And the way that I like to use uh, to treat acute gout traditionally now is to take uh, uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, uh, excuse me, steroidal, uh, short course of steroids, called a Medrol pack. It's a six-day course of cortisone, and uh, you take six pills the first day and five the second, four the third, et cetera. Very effective at treating acute gout. Now, any of those treatments do not lower the uric acid level. They um, simply get rid of the acute inflammation. So they, they're there to treat the attack that you're currently having, but they don't prevent the next attack. But we do have other medications which do uh, 
lower the uric acid level by generally blocking the enzyme that converts purines, which are protein breakdown products, to uric acid. The one that's used traditionally is allopurinol, uh, very effective uh, drug, trade name with xyloprim, but it's really now just known as allopurinol. Uh, there's another one called febuxostat, uh, which is a very similar mechanism, uh, somewhat more expensive and, and not a great advantage and pretty much used when and the rare person who is allopurinol hypersensitive, which is about one person in a thousand, most of those people can still use uh, Euloric. And then there's a drug called Cristexa, uh, which is um, a very potent drug at lowering uric acid levels, but it requires an IV every couple of weeks and has a lot of potential side effects and is extremely expensive. So it's generally not used unless patients have severe gout with the formation of large uh, deposits of uric acid called TOFI, uh, where you need to rapidly uh, bring the uric acid level down because uh, sometimes those TOFI have broken through the skin and are causing infections. But again, it's this drug that I have personally not seen a need for. So what we know about gout, we know about it, a high purine diet. So purines uh, are broken down into uh, uric acid and and then it can crystal. So people who are on a, a high purine diet, uh, which isn't very many people today, the foods with the highest amounts of purines are uh, things like organ meats, livers, sweetbreads, uh, little fish, kipper, sardine, and herring. Um, there's lesser amounts in shellfish and uh, gravies, other red meats, but not not huge numbers. So the the uh, low purine diet today uh, is is not as important as it was before we had effective medication. About the most you can lower your uric acid by diet is one. If your uric acid is nine, you might get it to eight. But when we treat people for gout, the goal is to have a uric acid less than six. We know that alcohol is a trigger, uh, not that it contains a lot of purines, but alcohol interferes with the kidney getting rid of uric acid. The same thing happens with diuretics. A lot of people are on diuretics for control of their blood pressure or for uh, heart failure. And uh, diuretics tell the kidney to get rid of uric acid, or excuse me, to get rid of salt water, but to hold on to uric acid. So there are times when we try to get people off diuretics if possible. Uh, the biggest issue with gout is compliance. A lot of gout is in young men. Uh, young men are not great, great patients. I used to be a young man and I wasn't a great patient. Um, it's hard to get people to commit to uh, chronic uh, lifelong therapy. No one wants the word chronic associated with their, with their name. So uh, the two issues we see in gout management, uh, one is patient compliance. Patient simply doesn't take the drug uh, and also uh, not prescribing an adequate amount. A lot of patients are given 100 milligrams of allopurinol a day. They're, they don't have their uric acid levels monitored to be sure that it's driven below six, and they continue to have, have gout. The maximum dose of allopurinol can be up to 800 milligrams a day. Uh, and uh, it's if patients are, are compliant and are given the, pro, the proper amount of allopurinol, uh, virtually everybody's get, gout can be brought under good control. So I think the last thing we got on here is fibromyalgia. It's always worth talking about. It's a chronic musculoskeletal pain syndrome. Uh, it is not an autoimmune disease. It's a disorder of central pain processing. Um, it's widespread pain for more than th three months. It's usually very diffuse. Uh, and particularly over soft tissue uh, tender points. Um, patients often have associated symptoms that uh, include uh, uh, poor sleep or non-restorative sleep, uh, headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, painful periods, uh, and fibro fog, uh, just problems with cognitive function. And actually many of the symptoms are in my mind, very similar to what's being described with long COVID. And um, 
I'm not sure there isn't some overlap because I think that uh, we know that sleep disorder plays a big role in the development of fibromyalgia. A lot of times what happens is people uh, were never great sleepers and then something happens, either a stressful event in their life, a physical stress or an emotional stress or something happens that takes that mediocre sleeper and makes them a bad sleeper. And I, I think with COVID, uh, a couple of weeks of coughing and not sleeping and feeling miserable uh, may trigger uh, some of these symptoms that are being called long, long COVID. Uh, I'm not saying that all the long COVID symptoms are similar to fibromyalgia, but many of them are that may play a, a role in the development of, of uh, long COVID. So these are the fibromyalgia tender points that have been tracked out. By definition, you're supposed to have at least 10 of the 16, but patients with fibromyalgia really are, are tender everywhere. They're just particularly tender in these uh, tender points. So again, should have 10 of 18. Many people are just, don't touch me any, anywhere at all. So sleep disturbance, fatigue, and diffuse pain with tender points, many associated symptoms, headaches, irritable bowel, dysesthesia means burny, funny, bad sensations, uh, often with mood disorder, uh, heightened perception uh, of pain, a disorder of central pain processing. A lot of the management of fibromyalgia is about patient self-management, getting the patient to do a regular low-impact exercise program. We know that of all the therapies that are out there, an exercise program for fibromyalgia is probably the most effective of um, weight loss, of simple analgesics, and particularly avoidance of opioids, of narcotics. So we use um, some of the older tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline in very low doses because they work on the pain receptor centers in the brain that increase serotonin levels. Some of the newer uh, SSRI type antidepressants like Cymbalta or Civella are used or uh, medications that are called membrane stabilizers or Neurontin or Lyrica all can play a role in the management of fibromyalgia. But again, we want to avoid nar narcotics. And then I just already commented about the potential relationship of fibromyalgia to, to long COVID. I think that's uh, what I wanted to cover. And we said I'd do it 45 minutes and that's about what it took. So uh, any questions you, you have, I'd be happy to try to answer for you. All right, Dr. Birnbaum. Thank you for that. I actually it took more than 45 minutes. I apologize. It's great. Thank you for all of the information. We have a ton of questions, almost 20. If you okay. are okay with it, I will stop your share screen so that we can um, get to these questions here. And I apologize if you hear a lot of um, sneezes in the background. It looks like my dog is having allergies. Oh, okay. Okay, so a lot of these questions were for registrants who submitted them right during registration. And could you speak on the effectiveness of Pilates for joint pain relief? So Pilates is good exercise because it's, it's low impact. And a lot of it is stretching and strengthening around the joints. You can't really make a joint stronger. You can make muscle stronger. So I like Pilates. It's more a question of doing something. And whether it's a Pilates, whether it's a walking program, whether it's an aquatics class, all of them are, are good. But Pilates is, is, is a good one because uh, it's low impact. It's hard to hurt yourself. Sounds good. Is it inevitable that if a person had trauma to a part of their body, such as their finger, um, that in the future they will have arthritis, especially in that part? It's not inevitable, but it's not un unlikely. Either. So we do talk about post-traumatic degenerative arthritis or post-traumatic osteoarthritis as being quite, quite common. Um, there's also probably a predisposition for gout to go into previously damaged joints. And maybe rheumatoid arthritis is more likely to involve a previously damaged joint than, than, than not, but that's not as clear. Thank you. 
Um, what are the non-best drug options that you might recommend for chronic osteoarthritis? Well, I think we touched on, on those initially. There are things, there's some things you can't change, like who, who were your parents? Because there is a genetic predisposition. Uh, but if people are significantly overweight, um, that's helpful to get weight off the, the joints, the large joints of the hips and knees. Um, I mentioned that, uh, unfortunately, the dietary things are not uniformly successful other than, than weight loss. But if people want to try a particular supplement or, or a particular diet, they can. Um, the largest study that was ever done with, was with glucosamine. Uh, it did not particularly work, but yet there are still true believers for those drugs, or those shouldn't say drug supplements. Uh, but unfortunately, we haven't made a lot of progress in osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is still about the management of, of pain. Mm. There is someone who's especially interested in drugs that relieve pain, but don't affect thinking. If you can speak to that. Perhaps maybe they mean brain fog. Well, so, so we want to avoid opioids. I mean, opioids or narcotics are really designed for very short-term use. You broke your leg, you had your appendix out, something like that. And they, and they really should be avoided for, for chronic long-term use. And, and they have all kinds of potential problems from habituation to constipation to, to foggy thinking. Um, a lot of the other medications in individual patients, they may feel something, but for the vast majority of people are able to take particularly the non-prescription Advil leave kind of drug. Okay. Um, and I really like this next question. How does a lay person recognize early signs of more serious joint problems so that they can better be advocates for their condition? Sure. So the things that you would be, uh, more of a warning sign I want to talk to your primary care doctor at least about would be um, worsening of pain. Pain is more than a nuisance. Uh, swelling of joints, uh, prominent morning stiffness, meaning more than just five or 10 minutes until you go to the bathroom. Um, are there associated symptoms? Are there fevers, rashes, weight loss, other things that would make you worry about a systemic autoimmune disease would be the ones that I would think most about. Could you comment on the usage of supplements such as uh, like 500 milligrams of turmeric pills? Like so turmeric has, right now is kind of the, the, the supplement du jour. Uh, every few years, something else comes along. Uh, I, I think people have to decide for themselves about those. There's, there is not a lot of science to back it up. There are a lot of, of these, what I would call anecdotal testimonials. It worked for me. And I already mentioned to you the, the high incidence of placebo response in most arthritis trials. Now, I don't have a problem with a placebo if the patient felt better, uh, as long as it's not something that has potential side effects or uh, is um, emptying somebody's wallet. Uh, but uh, am, am I going to endorse a particular one? No, because I should be practicing evidence-based medicine. I should be able to quote for you a well-done, peer-reviewed, scientific, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. That's the way we re really should be practicing medicine. That doesn't tell somebody that, that they shouldn't try other things that they've read about or, or heard about, but I shouldn't be endorsing that as a rule. Thank you. That's very responsible of you. Um, how can you figure out specific triggers? Like how would you get started with investigating specific triggers for flares? So that's been a, a subject of great controversy over many, many years of, of what causes a flare. And we do know that stressors uh, either a physical or emotional stress or someone going through another physical illness or there's a death in the family or their kids are sick or something to divorce. We, we know that those kind of coexisting problems can make arthritis harder to live with or cause a flare of arthritis. 
Uh, but other times patients will say, no, my life's fine and it's good, but I, I'm just flared up. And that happens too. So it, we don't always know, know what the cause is. Does swelling have a protective benefit? Is it the body's way of discouraging further damage? No, no. So there's two kinds of swelling. There's what I would call bony enlargement, uh, which I showed in the very first slide where the so-called knobby fingers. And then there's swelling that is um, oftentimes due to either thickening of the synovium and inflammatory disease within the, the joint lining uh, and let me get rid of, I gotta, get rid of that. There we go. Uh, or, or, the, or the production of joint fluid can cause swelling. So the body, as cartilage is worn away, can't make new cartilage. So what does it do? It either makes bone spurs if it's osteoarthritis, or it may make extra fluid. The fluid is there trying to do something, but it really doesn't accomplish very, very much. Um, this next question is about diet, and I think that you touched on this, and I will also link a video to one of our registered dietitians' video on inflammation and diet, but could you speak to how diet might be able to help flare-ups, um, and how is it that exercise could be so important at the same time painful for joints? So two different, really two different questions. I talked about diet. I think not much more I can say there. There, there are any number of, of these various arthritis diets. And if an individual finds that one or another helps them, that's great. Uh, uh, but the only thing, the only diets that are really well documented, one is a low purine diet in a patient with gout. And the other is a weight loss diet in a patient who's got bad hips and knees. The rest is, is really anecdotal. Um, and the other one was about. It was about part. exercise. How could about it be exercise? Yeah. Control? So as long, yeah. So as long as exercise is low impact, then you might be sore, but you're unlikely to damage something. Uh, so we talk about again walking, biking, swimming, Pilates, anything like that that's low impact. But what you're trying to do is maintain the muscles around the joint, or trying to maintain the range of motion of that affected joint. Uh, again, you can't make the joint stronger, it doesn't grow cartilage back, but it's trying to maintain the, the integrity of the structures around the joint. Got it. There's a difference between being, being sore and damaging something. And as long as you're doing low impact exercise, you could be sore, particularly if you haven't done it for a while, but you're not gonna damage something. Um, Valerie in the audience would like to know, why does bone on bone generate pain? Where are the nerves in bone matter? Ah, great question. Uh, the, the nerves are probably in the uh, capsule of the joint. There may be some in the, in the bone itself. Uh, I don't, it's been studied year, years ago, they, in people had back surgery. They actually, at the end of the surgery, did a study where they tied strings to various structures in the back and brought them out through the wound and then afterwards tried to pull on them to see if it re could reproduce pain. And it wasn't very re reproducible. Um, so, so it's hard to know exactly where the nerve endings are. I, I, I keep muted. myself there. There. Um, can working with a chiropractor help with joint pain? Ah, so I, I have to say that, you know, again, coming from a traditional Western MD point of view, I don't quite understand what chiropractors do. and I don't quite understand what acupuncturists do. However, there are certain patients who, you know, absolutely believe in those, those therapies. Uh, and I, I don't have a problem with people doing those. Uh, I don't think they're, I think they tend to work better for soft tissue kind of problems, um, aches, pains, sprains kind of things. Uh, I don't think they work very well for inflammatory disease. Uh, I would say that if someone has rheumatoid arthritis in particular, uh, vigorous spinal manipulation probably shouldn't be used because there are 
are rare cases of patients having instability at the first two cervical vertebrae way up in the uh, top of the spine uh, and, and uh, having real neurologic catastrophes after a chiropractic manipulation. So I would be nervous about that. But in general, if people want to try those things, okay with me. Can bad posture lead to long-term joint or bone disease? My mother would say so. She said, oh, he said, stand up straight. I, I think the posturing is probably more the secondary phenomenon than, than the primary, that if you get uh, degenerative disease of the spine or you get osteoporosis, it tends to bend you forward. And, and we all should be practicing good posture. Uh, now, the one, I think, time where it's more important is patients with spondylitis. Uh, this inflammatory disease of the spine, the traditional picture of the young male who I showed in that series of photographs uh, where young guys get all bent over and we really work in that situation to get them to do uh, chest expansion and spinal extension exercises. The position of comfort is to be bent over. So you really have to work to uh, keep the spinal extension. It's less of an issue today because the uh, anti-TNF biologics are so spectacular in spondylitis that if we get people into treatment before they've had some of these permanent changes, uh, they're gonna maintain the erect posture. We have one more question for you. And uh, what would be seropositive arthritis? What is in the blood that is not in seronegative arthritis? So what we're looking for are, are some autoantibodies. The two markers that are uh, there are one's called rheumatoid factor, and the other is called CCP, or cyclic citrullinated peptide, or if you're in Europe, it's called AGPA, A-G-P-A. Uh, these are uh, seen in patients who have, quote, seropositive RA. Now, about 20% of patients will not have those markers. They'll otherwise look, taste, and smell like an RA patient, and you call that patient seronegative RA, or you have patients who fulfilled criteria for other diseases like spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis. We simply call that a seronegative inflammatory arthritis. Uh, the patients who have uh, strongly positive rheumatoid factor and CCP antibody where the diagnosis of RA is very, very clear. If they're very high titers of, of those tests are very, very abnormal, they, they probably have a uh, worse prognosis and a reason to be more aggressive in, in therapy. Thank you, Dr. Neubernbaum. That was our last question. Um, this, we have actually one more question, but it's a little bit for me. And it's about our January events. And I want to use this moment to announce that uh, this lecture is not only our last lecture for 2022, it is the last lecture we'll be hosting for a little bit. Uh, we will be going undergoing some organizational changes where I think that we are looking into a new office. So we'll use the first quarter of the year to settle into our new location uh, pending and health education will commence, will resume after hopefully at the earliest May in 2023. Um, Dr. Birnbaum, this has been such a treat. It's always so lovely to host you and where we did a lightning round Q&A and this has been highly informational. Um, I encourage everyone to look out for a post-event email that I will be sending out. It will include where you can find today's presentation recording and along with the phone number to Dr. Birnbaum's office so that if you are interested, you might get in touch. Dr. Birnbaum, is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with before we end today? No, I have to thank you for your attendance and the time to take an hour and a half out of your schedule. Appreciate it and uh, hope you all learned something. I definitely did. And this has been very educational. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye-bye.